Hello and welcome to our Ashbourne Baptist Church uh, pre-recorded service. This is uh, hoping to be uh, put out on the internet and available on CDs on May the 3rd. And uh, so we're recording this in advance, it's actually Tuesday today, when we're recording this uh, for the hope that we'll be able to listen to it together as we worship the Lord in our own separate homes, uh, to also hear from his word and pray together. And then later on today, there'll be an opportunity uh, to meet together using a Zoom to uh, uh, talk together, pray together, and again, hear from God's word. And so, uh, one of our attempts to do uh, the best we can in these uh, strange circumstances and not being able to meet together. So it's great having you listening uh, to this uh, recording with us. And it's our prayer that we would, in, we would be helped to worship God uh, together. Let me read a few verses from Psalm 45. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite a composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of man, men. Grace is poured upon your lips, therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with glory and majesty. In your majesty ride forth prosperously because of truth, humility and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. Peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Let's come and pray, God, pray to God as we praise him together. Dear Lord God, our Father in heaven, Lord, we do come before you and we come to worship you, the one who is the king of all things, the one who loves righteousness, the one who hates wickedness, the one who is full of grace, the one who is fairer than any other, the one who is truth and righteousness, Lord, the one who reigns over all, Lord, we come and bow our knees and worship you. For you are the great God, most high. Lord, you are the creator of all things. Lord, we see your wisdom and your power in all that you have made. Lord, we see the way that you are in control of all things. And Lord, we honor you. We want to be in awe of you. And so Lord, we pray that you would teach us something of your glory. Show us something of your holiness, that we may be helped to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we pray that you would indeed meet with us. Uh, Lord, even though we cannot meet face to face with each other as brothers and sisters and members of Ashbourne Baptist Church, Lord, we pray that we still might know your presence with us. Lord, in an extraordinary way, in these situations that we find ourselves. Lord, as we listen to this recording, Lord, we pray that it wouldn't just be something electronic, something on a screen or on a device, but Lord, we pray that we might know that we're meeting with the living God and that by that power of your Holy Spirit that you might meet with each of us, we pray, in our homes, as we are here as individuals or couples or families, Lord, that we might meet with you, we pray. Lord, we do want to pray for the situation that we have going on around us. Lord, such a, an unprecedented situation. Lord, we pray that you'd give wisdom to our authorities in this country. We pray for Boris Johnson. We pray for the government. We pray for the scientific advisors. We pray for the leaders of the NHS. Lord, we do pray for your wisdom that you may make known to them, that they may make wise decisions as they deal with the trying to care for people who are unwell, as they try and stop the spread of this virus, as they try and keep some sort of semblance of normal life going and the essential things that are necessary for life here in this country. 
Lord, what a difficult balancing act they have. Lord, give them wisdom, we pray. And Lord, we do lift them up before you and pray for them. We pray for those who are suffering and struggling at this time. Some in our own community, in, in, in Ashbourne, in Derbyshire, and in this country, Lord, and right around the world. Lord, we pray that you might have mercy, we ask. Lord, that you may look down from your throne in heaven, Lord, and see the, the trials that people are in, see the suffering that there is. Lord, that you may see those who are lost with no shepherd. And Lord, that you may come alongside them, we pray in your grace. Lord, none of us deserve that at all, but Lord, you've been merciful to us. And so, Lord, we pray on behalf of others, Lord, would you have mercy, we ask, if it's your will. Lord, bless those we had used to have contact with at the church, those at Mums and Tots, those in the Boys' Brigade, the children and their parents, and those who are reached through various outreaches, even those not so long ago, a month or two ago, who received all those thousands of cards we gave out at Shrovetide, for those who've been given Gospels, and for those who've seen things about our um, online services and videos. Lord, we pray that you would use them, we ask, for your glory. Lord, that you would awaken, we pray, in people's hearts a desire to seek after you. Lord, we pray that too for loved ones of ours, children and parents, brothers and sisters, husbands, wives. Lord, we lift up these family members and friends before you, asking you to have mercy on them, we pray. And Lord, we do ask that you may draw near to us, we pray. We want to lift up before you our brothers and sisters right over this country, all meeting in similar situations to us at the moment. And we want to pray too for our brothers and sisters around the world, especially those who are suffering so badly and for those who are being persecuted, even in this difficult time already, where their sufferings are made even worse by the animosity of the authorities or their families. Lord, we ask you to give them your peace, we pray. And so, Lord, we ask that you may be glorified by all that we do and that you may meet with us, we pray. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me introduce to you a, uh, another hymn that we uh, can sing together. Uh, this one was written by uh, two ladies, Susan and Anne Warner. Uh, they were both born about 200 years ago. They were two sisters. Susan was the older one by four years and uh, Anna, her younger sister. They were uh, very famous uh, writers in their day. Uh, Susan was thought to be the first American woman to have sold more than a, th a million copies of a book. Uh, and they were extraordinarily uh, well received in their day writing many novels and poems of all sorts. And a lot of them had uh, Christian themes in them as well. And uh, in 1859, they published a, a novel, or Susan especially, published this novel called Say and Seal. And as with lots of novels, <laughs> it uh, was a, a bestseller for a while, but uh, soon passed out of uh, the limelight. But in it was a poem, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The poem, it seems, was written by her sister, Anna, whereas Susan wrote the novel. In the story, there were two characters, a lady called Faith Derrick and a man called John Linden. And they end up in this scene caring for a very sick little boy called Johnny Fax. And Johnny gets more and more unwell. And uh, Mr. Linden, who's a Sunday school teacher, takes up this little child in his arms and, and hugs him and comforts him. He's sort of sick with a fever and he tries to console him. And suddenly this little boy, Johnny, cries out, please sing to me. And so John began to sing a song which uh, neither Faith nor Johnny had heard before. 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. And in this novel, uh, he sings this song to comfort him in his last moments for this little boy. Although the, the novel has uh, been forgotten, the poem in it was not. And a famous composer, William Bradbury, uh, found it a few years later and uh, set it to music and added the chorus that we know, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. And uh, in it, a song that's sung to a child has become well known as a hymn that children know and sing. And it's our prayer, isn't it? That it wouldn't just be the words of a well-known poem or, or song, but it may be known to each one of us, the children and the adults too, as we reflect on that wonderful love of the Lord Jesus together. Well, we're going to carry on reading today from John's Gospel and chapter 15. Uh, we began last week looking at the vine and the branches, and we're going to carry on today from verse 12. So John chapter 15 and verse 12. 
maybe you'd like to read it aloud along with me. Let's hear God's word. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they would keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin, but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened, that the word might be fulfilled which was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not to say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Well, turn back again to John chapter 15 as we look at this uh, together now. I've given it the title, Last Lessons, Love and Hate. I wonder if you've ever seen anyone with those two words tattooed on their knuckles, love and hate, classic sort of a scene in a movie or something like that. Don't think I've ever seen it in real life. But they're two of the most basic human emotions, aren't they? Love and hate. And Jesus has a lot to say about those two words in that portion uh, that we just read together. And it's one of his last lessons. Jesus' last evening before he's crucified with his disciples. And he wants to teach them. And so through this lesson we find commandments and reminders and warnings and encouragements uh, all intermingled as he examines these two big emotions, love and hate. Firstly, encouraged by Jesus. We are loved by our friend. One of the things Jesus wants to do, one of the things I want to draw out is, he wants to encourage the disciples and us too, that we are loved by Jesus. Look in verse 12 and especially the last four words. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Four words, I have loved you. And those four words have been repeated several times in this last evening that Jesus spent with his disciples. Uh, just look at back in verse nine, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. It's all bound up in the, the love there is of the Trinity. The love between Father and Son is the love that's outpoured then from God himself to his people. I have loved you. And uh, it began back in chapter 13 
when Jesus uh, met with his disciples on this same evening. It's taken us a couple of weeks to get through it. Uh, but for the disciples, it all happened in a couple of hours. Look in chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This whole evening, this evening as it heads towards uh, his betrayal, his arrest, his crucifixion, is all framed in that language of love. He loved them to the end. So he washed their feet and he taught them and he encouraged them here with these reminders of his great love for them. And as we thought last time in verse 9 and 10, he tells them twice that you need to abide in my love. We thought last week about that uh, picture language, that parable of the vine and the branches. Uh, the vine, uh, the stem of it going down into the ground with its roots where it would drink up the water. Well, the branch would have to drink up from it everything it needed. And so do we. We need to drink up that love from Jesus and abide in it. For the disciples, this evening was going to be traumatic. Shortly after this, Jesus would be betrayed and arrested, put on trial and mocked and crucified. It was going to lead them to their moment of crisis. They needed to know that they were loved by Jesus. And so do we in our situations, perhaps especially when we're in difficult times, troubling times and moments of crisis, perhaps. We said last week that one thing we should try and do is every time you look in a mirror, remind yourself that you're loved by the King of Kings. I wonder if you've done that this week. I wonder if you've thought of another opportunity to remind yourself of that truth. Well, Jesus wanted to remind his disciples I have loved you. He presents it in a couple of different ways. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. To be chosen is to be loved. In this case, isn't it? For those of us who are married, we were chosen by somebody else, especially, at least in our culture and other parts of the world. You might have arranged marriages and things, but... but uh, if you uh, ask somebody, if you were to uh, ask somebody to marry you, they chose to say yes. Or uh, vice versa, they were the one who chose to, to propose to you. To be chosen is a sign of love, isn't it? And Jesus says, I chose you in love. And uh, the same for all of us, whether we're married or not. Those things that people choose to do for us are a gesture of love, aren't they? If we've received a gift at Christmas at our birthday, if we've got a, a card in the post or received a phone call from somebody, somebody chose to do that. They chose to show us that love. We are loved by Jesus. And his love is the greatest. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. And yet Jesus would lay it down for those who are still his enemies to make them his friends. We've been staggered, haven't we, uh, to think of those who have given their lives in service of this country, doctors and nurses. There was a, a moment of silence, wasn't there, on on Tuesday this week to remember those some 80 or so at that point who had died from a coronavirus after caring for those with it and we're staggered by their love and their service and their commitment. Jesus' love for us of course is, is slightly different to that though isn't it? because those doctors and nurses didn't intend to die and they didn't die in the place of somebody else. It was an unfortunate consequence 
of caring for those with this virus, that they caught it themselves. You only do that for love, don't you? You only do that because you love. And, and Jesus, though, on the other hand, well, you could keep the same sort of virus language, couldn't you? We have the sin virus. And Jesus, the doctor, who came for the sick, as he himself said, he comes to us who are infected and dying with this sin virus. And Jesus takes the virus on himself, absorbing it from us, transferring it to his own body, knowing it would bring about his own death. But by dying, he gives us healing from that virus and forgiveness and recovery and life. So what Jesus does is even more amazing, for his is a willful, voluntary action, taking death on himself to bring life to us, knowingly knowing it would cause him his death there in our place. We are loved by our friend. And so verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. He's our friend. We were his enemies. We had no love for him whatsoever, but he loved us. He gave himself for us and he calls us his friends. I wonder if you know that truth. Know what it is to wake up in the morning knowing you are loved by Jesus, your friend. It's a love he extends. It's a love he told his disciples about, and they were then to go and tell others about, of course. We are all loved by Jesus. And he urges each one of us to come and put our trust in him, to find that peace and friendship that is offered from God. At the cross, Jesus died there with his arms outstretched, ready to welcome us if we draw near to him and ask for his forgiveness. Have you done that yourself? Secondly, we're reminded by Jesus. Reminded by Jesus that the world hates God. He has a sad thing that he has to teach them at the same time. There is love, love that comes from the heart of the Father above, love between Father and Son, love that's extended to his people whom he's forgiven. But in this world we also experience hatred, and hatred comes from the world, it comes from sin. And so Jesus says in verse 18, and especially the, the, at the end of it, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus says the world hated me first. We might experience something of, of that hatred. Jesus will come to that in a moment. But, but the hatred of the world was focused on himself in the first place. The world hated me first. And so, uh, verse 20, remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But that's what happened to Jesus. They persecuted him. They heard his words and rejected him. And the world hates God. And when Jesus came into this world, he became the focal point of that hatred. And so he says in verse 22, uh, in the first instance about the Jews of his own generation, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Again in verse 24, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they've seen and also hated both me and my father. Now, Jesus isn't saying that the Jews uh, before, up to this point, had never sinned. Of course not. Or, nor the Jews of his own generation either. Of course, everyone is a sinner before God. 
But by Jesus coming into the world and then being rejected by them, they now had no excuse for their sin, as he says in verse 22. Beforehand, they didn't know everything. They didn't know much about God. And so they were guilty, but they had, their guilt had a certain measure to it. But now they knew more. Now the Son of God had come into the world and spoken to them, verse 22. Verse 24, he'd done among them these works, which no one else did. He'd shown them his words. He'd done before them these works, these miracles. They'd seen them, they'd heard them, and they'd rejected them. And so the more they knew, the more they were aware of, and the more they rejected, made them more guilty before God. They have no excuse for their sin, said Jesus in verse 22. And in verse 24, they've seen and hate it, both me and my father. The things they saw aroused in them a hatred of Jesus and his father too. He says it in verse 23, he who hates me hates my father also. And again in verse 21, they did not know him who sent me. And so they, Jesus can say they had no cause for it. Verse 25, this happened that the word might be fulfilled. It was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. There was no reason, no logic, no sense to it at all why they should hate Jesus so much. What hateful thing had he ever done? It was an inexcusable hatred that was there, whipped up by Satan, no doubt, but there in their hearts, this animosity towards God. Well, for the disciples, it was meant to be a reminder. Jesus keeps telling them those things. For instance, chapter 16, verse 1, these things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. I'm telling you these things before it happens, so that when it does happen, verse 4, you'll remember. It's there as a reminder. Jesus is laying this foundation for the disciples especially because soon they're going to see Jesus arrested and tried and crucified and people are going to hurl insults at him and mock him and ridicule him and the like. They needed to know what was going on. That Jesus says it's no surprise there is this hatred that there is towards him. And we need to know it too. So just as the disciples did, we need to know it too. That we will see the same sort of things. An, an insatiable, inexcusable, inexplicable hatred for Jesus. But it's also a warning for us. A warning for anyone who isn't trusting in the Lord Jesus and following him. If you could turn the clock back to a time when you'd never met a Christian, when you'd never heard about Jesus, when you'd never read a verse of the Bible, when you'd never heard anyone preaching the gospel. Well, even back then, uh, without any, uh, any more knowledge than that, you knew you did wrong things. Your conscience told you that. But you had a certain measure of guilt. But every time you meet a Christian who tells you of Jesus, every time you read the Bible, every time you hear the gospel being preached, every time you ignore it, your guilt goes up. You become more guilty because you've rejected more things that God has graciously made you aware of. Can I earnestly urge you, don't do that. I wonder if you've ever been ignored. You've uh, tried to strike up a conversation with somebody and they just turn their back and walk in the opposite direction. Or have you ever been walking along the road and you see someone coming the opposite way and they cross over the road to avoid you. It's such a hurtful thing, isn't it? Maybe they did it by accident, but, but often it can seem at least such a hateful thing. 
Well, we mustn't do the same thing to Jesus, must we? When Jesus offers his love and his forgiveness, and when he says he's the one who died for us on the cross, to walk on past, to ignore him, to reject him, makes us more guilty before him. How many times have you heard of the Lord Jesus and his promise of forgiveness and have ignored it or rejected it? And how many times might you still get the offer again? None of us know whether we'll hear that same offer of forgiveness again. We're meant to be reminded for, for this to turn to the Lord Jesus now while we have the chance. Today's the day of salvation. Who knows whether there'll be a tomorrow for that, for us. We must turn to him now, not have that natural hostility. We don't like being told off. We don't like being pointed out our faults. We don't like feeling guilty. But to let those things keep us away from Jesus is utter foolishness. He's the one who loves. He's the one who offers us himself. He's the one who died that we may be forgiven. Thirdly then, we're warned by Jesus. Warned by Jesus. The world hates Jesus's friends. The disciples needed to be aware of that. Not only would that help them understand what happened to Jesus that evening, the hatred that the world had of God and of Jesus, but they need to be aware too of what was going to happen to them in the not too distant future. The world hates Jesus' friends. And Jesus puts it to them in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. It hated me first, is Jesus' point that we've looked at already, and it will hate you second. You'll be next. Part of it is, in chapter 16, verse 1, these things I've spoken to you, that you, may not, you should not be made to stumble, and that there shouldn't be any surprises. As we say, to be forewarned is to be forearmed for the disciples to know the things that would happen to them would uh, help them understand it when it did to prepare for those things. He gives them a couple of reasons why that is the case. The world has this hatred of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the son whom he sent. And then the world will hate God's people. Look in verse 20. Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. One of the reasons the world will hate God's people is because you serve me. You're my servants, says Jesus in verse 20. You, you follow me, you obey me, and that will make you a target to others. By following in my ways, that will mean living in different ways to other people. And because you serve me, that will make you vulnerable to this persecution and this hatred. He says in end of verse 20, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. Implying again that the disciples that God's people will be sharing God's word and living by his word, and that will be rejected just like the words of Jesus were too. So there's one reason, because you serve me. A second reason, because you carry my name, verse 21. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Because you carry my name, that will make you the uh, objects of the world's hatred. And that's what the word Christians means. Christians are the Christ ones, the ones who follow Christ, the ones who carry his name. That's what it meant. And to be one of Christ's ones, to be a Christian, 
means to carry the name of the Lord Jesus. And the devil can't do anything to hurt Jesus himself anymore. He's ascended into glory. He sits on the throne. But the devil and the world will do all they can to those who carry Jesus' name. And a third reason, because you're mine. Verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Another reason why the world hates is because you are mine. You've been chosen out of the world. You've been made different. You've been changed. You now have a different nature, a different master, a different home, different priorities, different passions, different desires. You are mine. You're not of the world. You were, but now you've been chosen out of that and now you're different and therefore the world hates you. The disciples needed that warning of Jesus. And so do we need that honest, don't we? That honesty. Jesus warns us many times that we need to count the cost. He doesn't try to lure us in under false pretenses. And nor must we in our evangelism and the way we present the gospel to others. As we teach our young people and the children in the church, we want more than anything for them to love and follow Jesus. But we do want them to be aware, too, of what it will cost. That to follow Jesus may mean they're picked on at school or teased. They might be laughed at. They might face angry comments. Living for Jesus will mean hard decisions. It will mean costly things, costly decisions. Some careers where Christians can't work. Either they're not right for them to work there, or, or people have made things so difficult for Christians to work in those places and the like. In this country, the persecution we face is, is at a fairly low level, isn't it? It's likely to be that, teasing and, and laughing, a few daft jokes, a few angry comments and the like, and perhaps a little bit of restrictions here and there. But for some, it is much worse. Look in chapter 16, verse 2. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Jesus perhaps specifically talks to the disciples that the time will come when they'll be excommunicated from the synagogues. They'll be cast out of those places. And there'll be those who are killed even motivated by some misguided belief that that murder would please God. And that shows how far wrong they've got that, doesn't it? But Jesus says, I've told you these, these things in advance that when it happens, you may remember. Jesus warns the twelve of the kind of things that would happen to them. They did end up being put out of the synagogue. They did end up, many of them being killed, very few of them, maybe only John himself, lived to an old age. Many of them died in their prime, we might say. And yet we're warned by Jesus of those things, that even for us in the United Kingdom, the world hates Jesus' friends. It won't be easy being a Christian. And yet, that is what we will face. Uh, Paul says the same sort of thing in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If we want to live godly lives and follow Jesus, there will be persecution of one sort or another. And yet, at the same time, there's an encouragement uh, in that. Uh, Jesus told his disciples in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. As we said already, he's made us different. 
we have a different home. We don't belong in this world. And so if this world hates us and rejects us, well, we need to remember, blessed are we, for we have a home. We have a reward. We have a blessing that comes from God. Lastly then, fourth thing, we're commanded by Jesus. We are called to love. Through this, we've seen these different strands of Jesus' teaching. He wanted to encourage them that they were loved. He wanted to remind them that the world hated him. He wanted to warn them that the world would hate them too. And he wanted to command them that in this world of hatred, in this world where we may face hostility, we're not to follow the world's agenda, but we're to follow Jesus's. He's the one who poured his love out on us, and we as his people are those who are called to love. So look in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. It's the second time he said that, um, that evening. Already he said it in chapter 13, verse 34 where he said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And so he says to them this second time now in the evening, to love one another, his commandment that he's given. He repeats it again a third time in verse 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. Here is Jesus' last lesson. The last bit of time he'll spend with his disciples before he dies. And he gives them the commandment. Well, elsewhere, Jesus will talk about the two greatest commandments. One of those, of course, being to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And a second one, to love your neighbour as yourself. Well, as John would say in his letter later on in our Bibles, you can't say you love God, whom you've never seen, unless you love your neighbour, unless you love your brother, whom you have. So Jesus says there's this one commandment, this new commandment that he gives them, that they should love one another. By this, the world will know you're my disciples. By this, there'll be demonstrated that love you have for God, and that will be shown to be genuine by a love you have for others. The world hates. The world's a place of hatred, and often it doesn't seem very far away. Sometimes there can be a nice, happy sort of veneer to things, uh, it's nice, everyone at the minute having up these little signs and saying we're all in it together. But sometimes it is just a very thin veneer. And underneath there's all sorts of hostilities bubbling away. The world is a place of hatred. But God is the one who is love. He's the one who's poured his love out on us. And he's the one who calls us to love. It's the sign, the proof that we are followers of the Lord Jesus. He tells them in verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. You're my friends if you obey. If you obey what I command, and this is the command, to love one another. So are we? Are we those? who are seeking to share that love of Jesus with others. Partly, he's talking about other Christians, that you love one another. Probably in the first instance, he's talking about the disciples loving each other. Uh, don't forget, of course, this same evening, Luke tells us they're arguing about who's the greatest. There needed to be greater love between those 11 disciples who are there in the room. And so there needs to be love, doesn't there, between us and our brothers and sisters in Christ, those of us who make up Ashbourne Baptist Church and the like. In contrast from the world, the church should be a little oasis, shouldn't it, of love. 
We should be able to walk in when we're allowed to, uh, to meet together again and almost breathe a sigh of relief and say, here in this place, surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm loved. To share that love with others. Love within a church, love between brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's a love that's not restricted like that. That is one of the focuses of it. But it's a love that's not sort of hoarded and isolated. As Jesus himself said, love your neighbour uh, to the, the lawyer. And the lawyer then replied, well, who is my neighbour? Jesus told the parable of the good Samaritan, the Samaritan who loved the injured Jew. Our neighbour is anyone. To love one another is to love everyone we come into contact with. Jesus himself talked about loving your enemies, loving those who persecute you, even those who are showing you hatred. We need to show them love. It's a love that flows out, a love that has been shown to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so a love that is shared to other Christians, to our church family, a love that is shared with our neighbours and with all of those we come into contact with even those who are hostile towards us. We've been called to love. And so aren't we? The disciples needed to be reminded of that. They weren't a lovely bunch by nature. Jesus had to remind them again of those things. And if we're honest, neither are we. We don't find it natural to love but called and commanded by Jesus. That is what we aim to do and pray that we may do more. You see, linking it to last week, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. We've been chosen to bear fruit. Part of the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's one of the fruits that we should show. And we can pray, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. If we think that fruit is lacking, we can ask the Father to make us more fruitful, to help us to be more loving. I think as well there's a little bit of an echo here of what Jesus would say later on at the Great Commission, I've appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. That changes the language slightly of vines and branches. Here the picture is of going out and bearing fruit. Just like Jesus would say to his disciples before he ascended into heaven, go and make disciples of all the nations. To go and bear fruit, to go and share with, of the love of Jesus, to go and share the gospel to go and bear fruit, the fruit of seeing people saved, the fruit of seeing the gospel breaking into hard, cold hearts, asking the Father in Jesus' name for those things, that fruit of seeing souls saved. And Jesus says in verse 26, uh, that's why the Holy Spirit is coming. The Holy Spirit will testify of me. And then verse 27, and you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. You will testify too. Again, the 11 disciples, they've been with Jesus from the beginning. They were going to be the primary witnesses, those who would write the Gospels and the like. But we too are sent out to testify with that help of the Holy Spirit to go out and bear fruit for the Lord Jesus, sharing and showing that love of God, sharing that gospel of the love that's been made known through the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. We're called to loving gospel witness, loving evangelism, telling people of Jesus' love, showing people Jesus' love, and seeking that fruit that only the Father 
can give. And so in these last lessons, Jesus reminds them of the hatred of the world and warns them of the hatred they and we might suffer too. But he wanted them to be encouraged and to us that we're loved by our friend and we're commanded and called by him to go and share that love with others. Let's pray to finish. Dear Lord God, we do thank you for these last words of Jesus. We thank you for the great wisdom that he shared with his disciples and with us. Lord, we thank you for those reminders to understand the world and its hatred, the way it hates God and sometimes the way that we all know that we're hated too. Lord, we pray that you would help us in that. We don't like it, we do struggle with it, even with the minor sorts of persecution we can have here. Lord, help us to be encouraged to know that we're loved by the King of Kings. We're loved by Jesus. Lord, we thank you for that great love. And we pray that you would help us to love others. Lord, stir in us, give us that fruit, we pray, that we might love you more, that we might share with others, tell people of the love of God in that gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and share with them that love that he has shown to us. Lord, make us fruitful, we pray. Lord, stir in us that fruit that only you can produce through the Holy Spirit, that we may be those who are shown to be your disciples. For we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus and for his glory. Amen. <laughs>